You're so, good. my name is Lennart Franzen, and I'm up on GitHub, Lennart FR on GitHub. The presentation you're going to see here has this URL, ibm.biz, for which that's SFHL 2018. Please, if you fork it, I'll give you a nice gift. And if you add something to it, IBM may give you a nice gift. I am a developer advocate with IBM, working on blockchain, AI, and, and a number of other technologies at the same time. And let's see what we're going to start with. I thought I'd start with, at the very beginning, and what's so special about this event, October 2008. Oh, 2018. 10 year anniversary of one of the most one of the major events in the 2000s with enormous implications for the rest of the world. How many people here have read this paper and know about it? Okay, good. We can continue. But the double spending problem in Satoshi Nakamoto's paper is as important today as it was 10 years ago. And uh, it is a very, very good paper to reread re from time to time to see exactly what he wanted to do and what he has to, been able to accomplish so far. And then we have some news item updates. Uh, I'm sorry, first of all, we can talk about this paper here, which deals with security and cryptography in blockchain. IBM is contrib contributing to blockchain in many, many ways. We have lots of people working on the code itself. We have people marketing the product. And we have the researchers, especially in Zurich, working on a number of innovations. And Christian Kachin is one of the major researchers in Zurich. And if you're interested in crypt cryptography and, and Hyperledger, you can contact him directly with questions. He's a key person to know about what goes on in blockchain and hyperledger. And he is very visible. Things are happening. How many people here have heard of the Hyperledger Ethereum Enterprise Ethereum Alliance? And what do you think of it? What are your opinions on that? Uh, uh, no comment. No, that's fine. It's very exciting, to be sure, that we, are no, we no, no longer have two camps fighting by the way trying to join forces. It also shows that maybe they didn't, were not as successful in the beginning on their own as they hoped to be, and now by joining forces they can uh, have even more impact than they had before. But this is a very major, a very major occurrence uh, any, uh, uh, that they are joining forces, which I read in Europe where I was until yesterday, last night. And uh, you have to really read up more on what this will foretell about how we can work together. Here is an interesting news. Now I seem to read all my happy that you know on, on uh, sources like this. Robert Palatnik tells US, so US FinTech attendees the DTCC itself with 1.5 quadrillion securities transactions in the US in 2011. They now recently moved the known mainframe over to the DTC Tech. It's in a private permission based Ethereum network and uses Hyperledger Explorer for governance. This again is a major, major innovation, major, major uh, if, if, if attempt to make Hyperledger and all other blockchains much more reliable and you know, get them higher speed. And we'll talk more about the speed later. But this is, this is really fabulous, what they can do today. Hyperledger performance metri metrics. This was a question we couldn't even ask as late as a month ago. Because we were just throwing out numbers. We were just saying, well, we have so many transactions. We have so many uh, on Bitcoin. We have so many on Ethereum. We have so many on these various things without explaining what we actually meant by transactions. Now we have a working group focusing on that 
not just focusing on coming up with a number, but by focusing on coming up with what are we measuring? How do we measure it? And what measurement makes sense? Showing again that hyperledger is maturing. There, is, there used to be a metric that said that when the product, product hit, hits uh, 4.0, it's mature enough to begin to be used. What is the, the, the uh, release number of the latest Hyperledger fabric? 1.2, I think now. No, beyond that. But it's not even 2 yet. So the point is that there's still lots of time for growth. We can write fabulous programs, fabulous solutions in Hyperledger Fabric, but it is not mature yet. Nobody can say that. It doesn't mean that it isn't good to be used. It can be, we, can, we can use more and do marvelous things with it, but we are growing at a rapid pace as well, and you'll see that here. So the fact that we can now do performance metrics is a new, very, very good innovation that we have just added. Let me then quickly jump over to this thing, which you have to, that's why you have you brought your smartphone with you. IBM has not only contributed to Hyperledger Fabric, we are also creating sample applications, code patterns. Every week, every day, every hour, it seems. We have a group here in San Francisco and in Austin and in Europe and elsewhere, simply writing open source sample applications, code patterns, that we want you to use, to download from GitHub where they are, fork them, and we love you, and add to it, and you become our heroes. This is new for corporations. It used to be so that you had got, when you saw someone wanted to use one of the sample applications, you got a, a must read of about two pages, saying, if you do this, we will come and kill you. If you do this, you know, without our permission, we will sue you. Here, it is the opposite. If you don't use it, it will be very sad and we'll start to cry. Please use our stuff. And the reason you should be aware of this is because if you do it and if you fork it, you will be known to us. And if you're interested in getting a new job, that is not bad. To be known as somebody who forked in a sample application from IBM, for instance, to create a fair trade supply network, created the oil deploy blockchain network using hyperledger fabric to SDK Java, implementing asset securitization on the blockchain ledger. Take one of those things and create your own private version of it. Adding to it, subtracting to it, and creating something that you then uh, have us accept, and you're suddenly becoming known. It is much better than sending uh, questions to recruiters or answers to recruiters. So this is something I really want to uh, bring home to you, that this is really, really good. It's not just IBM telling you this is the way it is. Just sit down and listen and do what we tell you. You can say that, no, 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 you're good with IBM, but you're not this good, and here are some my, my uh, suggestions for improvements of your code, which, again, I think is something to be aware of. So Hyperledger, we usually refer to Hyperledger as Hyperledger. But Hyperledger is not just one product, it is a number of products, as you can see here. Hyperledger Burrow, small contract machine, permissible. Hyperledger Fabric, which is the one we, I'm going to talk about. Hyperledger Indies, decentralized identity, which we had talked to somebody about here earlier. Very, very exciting. Iroha, mobile application focus. Sawtooth, permission and permissionless support, EVM transaction facility, family family. Hyperledger Caliper, blockchain framework benchmark platform. Cello as a service deployment. Composer, we talk more about here. Explorer, we talk also more about here. And Quilt, Ledger Interoperability. And this, these all have Linux Foundation as their owner, if you will. And Linux Foundation, if you didn't know it by any chance, if you've been spent, spent the last five years under a rock someplace, is a, a powerhouse in, in open source. It's a virtual powerhouse in open source. And they've taken this under their, their wings and are doing everything they can to improve these products, have people focus on them, 
and especially have the products work together more and more. Very, very, very exciting. So it's not just a matter of hyperledger composer now or hyperledger uh, fabric. It is a number, a number of other products that are also coming into their own and that you can do lots of things with. How many people here have worked with hyperledger fabric? How many people know something about hyperledger fabric? Very good. Are there any questions about hyperledge fabric? Or tell, can you tell me what you are doing with it and what you would like to do for it, perhaps? Anybody? You. Here's your chance. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so it sounds like I can get started today, right? I go to the patterns and I can. Like... You can get something up and running within the next couple of hours. No problem. But I think the problem I see, not the problem, but the, the question I see when I talk to developers and startups is that it's not just a matter of, hey, I want to be part of the cool thing. So hey, let me loosen that, I write something, especially, you know, uh, there are lots of things you can do that are easy to write. But on the other hand, I think that the last thing you should do is to begin to write apps. You should begin to look at use cases and also to see, to see if you really, if there are any, any, any reason for writing the app you want to write, uh, write, if any other people have written similar apps before really understanding how the uh, product works. Uh, I do have a question. Yes. Um, so in Ethereum, uh, in order to prevent people from abusing the system and running too much computation, mm -hmm. right, there's this concept of gas, which costs yes. something. Yes. Um, is there something equivalent? So if I were to start using this and building, uh, well, let's say I ignored your advice and went out and built some apps and had some people using it, would they have to pay gas transaction for using no. it? No. Okay. It's quite different. And this, this, this will consensus where if all of us here want to work on an app application together, we will have a consensus. We all have to agree essentially to the transactions happening. And that has lots of, lots of implications downstream. So the answer is no, this is quite different. And the two, the Ethereum and, and the Hyperledger are different. But on the other hand, they are becoming, they are getting more and more close to being merged, not totally merged, but more and more merged. Everybody's talking to everybody because everybody's open source. And there's an enormous amount of overlaps, overlapping functions here where people are starting to borrow. For instance, we, there are no tokens in Hyperledger Fabric. If you mention that, if you mention that you like tokens, people will slap your wrists, your hands, and all other parts of your body. And still, underground, there are talks of tokens in Hyperledger Fabric because it makes, may make sense. So that's the, you, you know, you, you, the, the reason you want to be interested, I think, in Hyperledger uh, and also in Ethereum and all the other cryptocurrencies is because there's so much exciting new stuff happening there. It's innovation upon innovation upon innovation. And then where, you, where it ends up, nobody will know where it ends up for you. You don't know, but if you know, if you learn the technology here, it's going to be very good for your career and you're going to learn lots of things that you can use elsewhere if you choose to do so. Or else just write cooler applications in this space. Yes? Um, can you compare the difference between Fabric and Sawtooth? Your, your, your material is very similar. Um, yeah, you know, Sawtooth, I have, no, I have no experience with myself. Has anybody else here worked with Sawtooth? No, it's a very wide field to cover, but uh, maybe I can get back to you. It's not a combination. Well, hopefully soon. <laughs> So here we have hope, uh, the Hyperledger architecture at the high level. You see we have memberships, because here we have to join a Hyperledger application, you have to be a member. You can't just join without identifying yourself. So it's a permissioned architecture. We have to know who you are. If you like, we, if you, we like you, you can join. Otherwise, you cannot join. So we have membership services, registration, identity management, and auditability. We have blockchain itself, and we have blockchain services, consensus manager, P2P protocol, distributed ledger, and ledger storage. What is so special about these things? They all expect they can all be changed. If you don't like my P2P protocol, you can insert your own. If you don't like my ledger storage, you can insert your own, etc. And we have chain code, also known as smart contracts. It's still plug and play. This is very, very important. It's not just do it this way or not. You can do it this way or you can do it your own way. 
So again, for you to become well known and famous in the industry as, an, as a, a technology guru is simple because you can just fiddle with these things, find something that you like that nobody else uh, found out about and run with it. That's what I see being the most exciting. Would you agree or not agree with that? I would, I agree in the fact of innovation and everything else. Right. From a, from a business owner and somebody who's trying to create revenue, um, I think, I, I never want to be first, right? I want to be a close second because I don't want to be the first one that's spending all the time and effort no, right. burning everything to create something right. to then everybody else go, that's a great idea, but you've done it all wrong, so we're going to learn from all your mistakes and do it right. And then by that point, your two sunk costs are too high and you're kind of stuck with it for a while. You're too level-headed for your own good, yes. I know, right? So, no, but it's very so, good. And that's something that I think, you know, that I really like about Hyperledger with the, the backing of the Linux Foundation and, and IBM, for example, right. is that to me is where I see the benefit will come, mm -hmm. whereas Ethereum is a lot more loose in that way, where I think Hyperledger is a lot more business focused and I think it will come to the point where there's a lot more templates and a lot more um, structure and foundation around templates as to where you go and where you build right. from. Because I think one of the key things for me, if you think three years, five years, ten years down the track when everybody's kind of into this technology, you then start looking at the next stage which is how do I connect my ledger to somebody else's ledger? Right, and that those thoughts have already started to mature. Right. Yeah. Which then starts the ethics, right? And that's the, right. you know, that's kind of, I mean, it'd be much further down the line, but, you know, it's those kind of things that I sort of think of as to go, you know, like I said, I just don't want to be, I don't, I, I don't want to be bleeding edge. No, 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 and that's a very good point. But I think also we're seeing that lots of smart people are congregating to this space. Mm, absolutely. Which is, which is good for the space itself. Uh, can you ask a question? Yes, of course. So, uh, I think you mentioned that consensus manager yes. is plug, uh, pluggable, right? Yes. Right. So you have probably some kind of a default manager. Right? Mm -hmm. So can you give examples of kind of you know well-known uh, consensus servers that people try to plug in and you know there was seamless integration and everything? Well, I'll come to something close to that uh -huh. in, in a few minutes. But let me start with. Let's see if I can do this right. We'll, um, here we go. The composer. Early on, we decided that it would be good to make the writing of applications for Hyperledger Fabric as simple as possible. We shouldn't have to go in and write Golang code and so forth because that was not good for business people who may want to write applications. They know the application they want to write, but they didn't, wouldn't know how to write the code itself. So therefore, we came up with the Hyperledger Composer, which is a way, it's, think of it almost as COBOL of its day, today, for business people to write applications. Just like COBOL was. We can think of COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never write, wrote, co wrote COBOL, but uh, I've been told that that was uh, something that's similar to this thing. So now, if you guys, there was somebody who, this who said, can I follow along here and write some code? I think it was you in the red, that t-shirt. You're on. <laughs> no, but if you want to. If I want to, okay. I think I'll watch, please. Yeah. But here is the composer. So the first you notice that we haven't uh, signed in in any way. We have not paid IBM any money. We're running on the open web. And we're just bringing up the composer. Here we have something called a wallet. It is not a wallet like in, in uh, Bitcoin. But we can enter here the name of our network, the business network to be used for, get the network admin card, etc., etc. And if we can get a little bit more, here we have it. And here we have the nice thing. And we'll just go down here. We have about 12 template applications ready to run that you can just click on, bring up, and begin to modify. They run as is, but you can now modify them. You can change, for instance, from if you're in sheep, 
and who isn't. We have an animal tracking network. You can change that to tracking something else, like Hollywood movie stores or whatever is business uh, important today. Bond network, car auction network, digital property network. And you can get it from your friends and neighbors, and you can contribute these to others as well. The reason this is nice is because it shows you what uh, Hyperledger Fabric is aiming at. It's aiming at business people to make it as simple as possible for you, for anybody, to create an application and run, get it up and running. So that if we are all business people here, we can just get together with a minimum of training on this thing and begin to churn out our application. We could have something, certainly by tomorrow afternoon, we could have something that we think, this is a good use case. This is a pattern that we want to use. And let's take a look at what we, we can click here. Connect. Let's get my glasses turned the right way. And here we have it. And now we can see the, how this is genius, this genial this is. We have participants. The business network defines participants, farmers and the regulator, assets and animal, a business field and field, transactions, animal movement departure, animal movement arrival, and setup demo. Because in any business setting, we have participants in the business. No matter what we do, we have business, but we, I'm trading with you somehow. We're trading something. If it isn't cheap, it's airplanes, or, or it's gold, or it's Bitcoin, or whatever. Bitcoin may be even better than anything else. But we are, we are people who are trading something. And then we have assets. We're trading something. Animals, business feeds, et cetera, et cetera. And transactions. What kind of transactions are we trading? What are we defining here? And then we can begin to build this application with the, these three components, participants, assets, and transactions. And everything here is part of this template. We have here also here a model file. And here is the code. Here is the, the COBOL of today. Let me see here if I can do this carefully. Here we see we have a namespace. You recognize that. We have an enum, animal type. We have the movement status. It's in the field or it's in transit. We have a production type, meat, wool, dairy, breeding, other. And we simply make these things up. I can certainly see us doing that here uh, if we were in the same business. We have former participants. We have an e that he has an email, a first and last name. Former participants have, have uh, addresses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Regulated participants and field assets. Define, 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 define. It's almost boring. In an, an animal asset, which is related to a field, animal identified by animal ID. String animal ID, etc., etc., and the field location is optional and former owner. And we continue like this. This is how you begin to create applications. Does it make sense? I would have been like to see a little bit more in energy in the nodding, but I'll take what I can get. We're not done yet. How do we define performance or ac action here? We do it in JavaScript. This is where it is no longer possible to say that it's just a matter of defined static assets. And here you can see the kind of code we are expected to write here. And I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but it's not very complicated. We have movement and departure of animals, movement and departure of animals, waiting asset registry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's very it's simply moving things around in the in the network. I own a goat. You want to buy the goat. You want to buy me 10 Git, uh, Bitcoin for it. And then we arrange where to, get the, where to change the goat and what money to pay. Or cars or whatever. This is a very easy way to get started. And a very easy thing to learn. And yet, there is a problem with it, which I will tell you, if you promise not to tell anybody. 
We have some more here. The problem we found is that it is easier to move the composer functionality into the base code and to have it stand alone like this. So we're working on making much, it's still, it's still usable, it's still something that you, you can do, but the, the performance is not optimal at the end of, of this exercise. So instead we are going to add, uh, to upgrade the composer, may still have a composer, but have it talk more directly to the underlying strata. But it's still, it's still a very good way to learn. So the composer comes with a number of subcomponents. Yeah, I'm certain you will know Yeoman. We are using Yeoman to generate the code, the skeleton code here. Here you see Composer CLI comes with the, uh, with the Composer components, CLI. REST server with a loopback connector and the web playground. These things think we generate because we want to get something that is running at the end. We still have all the components, static components we generated. We have the fabric, web, and embedded Node.js. And then we have the various, we mentioned this model, model file script file, access control, and also we have a query file. So these are all components we have generated, or we are generating. And then we have, we can run it cloud local or online. So this is something again we can get started learning tomorrow, and by tomorrow midnight, or even before that, by noon, we will be pretty close to expert if we have some programming background. If we now want to begin to work on the real blockchain application, here is what I think we need to start by understanding. We need to get all the details of who we are and what we are going to do clear in our minds. We can't just say, take three, four people and say, hey, let's go build something. We have to realize that we need the blockchain architect. And the blockchain architect must understand cryptography, must understand blockchain, must have written a blockchain or hyperledger application, and must be able to answer all the questions that we may not be answering. We have the enthusiasm, we have the programming skills, but we don't know the space. So we need the blockchain architect. We also need the blockchain developer. He or she de develops applications, and that's pretty much what we have shown you. That is not that complicated. Smart contracts is really all you write. We have, we have a car manufacturer. We have so this many cars. The cars are these, these models. They, the only, somebody wants to buy these many cars. We have to move them more in, in another state. Moving cars around is not very complicated. So smart contracts is what the developer, the developer's world is, is bounded by smart contracts. That's all you do. Don't ask any questions. Just do, do your smart contracts. And that's what goes on. Blockchain network operator operates the network. The network is, can be quite complicated. It's not a simple thing. You and I can create a, can create a blockchain uh, network in half an hour. We can actually do it here, even before we end. I end. You know, do you want to try it? Should we time it? There's lots of pizza surprise. But the operator, the network operator has a lot of work to do especially as these things scales. It's easy to get an, an operator network you know, going, but then when it has to co co coexist with other networks and so forth and so on. And one thing with the network operators that he also has to understand that there are external uh, architectures, external products he has to be able to coexist with. Everything is not just blockchain. Traditional pr processing platforms, this is the key, the key thing here. This is the absolutely the key thing. If we write an application, no matter what it is, it is not going to be a blockchain application bounded by the world that doesn't understand us or does understand us. We have to be able to get legacy access to legacy applications. Patient records, for instance, customer records, all of those things are not going to you know, say, okay, sorry, 
we, we give up, we give you all our, our customer records. They're not going to do that. They are making millions of the customer records today. We have to coexist with them. It's not going to be a one size fits all here. So the blockchain network operator will access traditional processing platforms and traditional data sources. If you understand that, you're on your way to understanding blockchain. If you don't understand it, sorry, you should probably do something else. And then membership services is pretty obvious because we have memberships here and blockchain users B2B transactions. And the regulator perform oversight. But most of these things you need in one phase. You don't need that many people perhaps, but you need people who know these things and have this have these knowledge. And that is not simple. You can get started without it, in my opinion, with just one or two people. Actually not one person, two people. But unless you get these skills, if, if you unless you can get a blockchain architect who can talk really heavy with other people on the same ilk. You're not going to succeed, I think. Would you agree or not agree with that? Yeah. Can I ask you something? Yeah, yes. You mentioned that um, uh, we have to access data from the traditional data. Yes. Uh, yes. So what type of data actually resides on the blockchain? I'm sorry, what? What type of the data you consider to, you know, to put on the blockchain, which would be auditable? Well, it could be data that if, if the data does not, if it's new data that doesn't exist anywhere else, obviously you put it on the blockchain. But what goes on the chain and off the chain is a very, very complicated situation because first of all, do you want to put healthcare records on the blockchain, for instance? The healthcare is one of the most popular areas for blockchain. There is a healthcare working group out. You may have heard of that. It's very, very actively pursued. So, so hashes of uh, the documents of uh, the healthcare, you would not do. We, 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 I would not put healthcare records there because first of all it's heavily regulated and I wouldn't get involved in, with the regulation. But also, take, take my healthcare records for instance now. They would is in, include uh, x-rays on my body. X-rays are gigantic. They are gig, gig, gigabyte and gigabyte and gigabytes of data. You cannot put that on the, on the blockchain. Right. But nobody talks about you know, putting the record itself. <laughs> Uh, even supply, uh, supply chain, right? Right. Very popular. You know, very popular. Uh, yes. Supposedly, I'm going to trade, I don't know, claims, and I want to know the record of this claim, you know, as a history of the agent and other parts, you know, and what breakages were, etc. So, this data, you could put on the blockchain. Right. It? No, absolutely. I, I think the reason I'm saying what I'm saying is because I have come to realize that too many people I've talked to think that if you start a blockchain application, I'll put all the data there. And it's more the, in my, my uh, suspicion and actually knowledge that the people who own crucial data are not going to give it up for free. Real estate, for instance, is also a very important area for blockchain. And I've met at least three companies who came to talk to me about their real estate application and who wanted to put the, the uh, housing information, house information on the blockchain. But they're owned by somebody else already. So why should they give you, and they, they, this is a billion dollar business all across the US. So why should you think that they would give that up to you? Well, they probably want to be on the blockchain as well, they said, and I said, they know they won't. They want to make money in their own, own fashion way. So it's just an insight, I think, that the world is going to be complicated once you begin to write real applications. And that you have to be prepared to say, okay, we will, we will buy the data from you instead of you giving us the data. So through an API. I mean, that's what happens to most of the, the applications today anyway, that you buy it through an API. It can be a very cheap price, but still you need an API to get there to it. But then uh, how do you would it support chain? How do you would it? Yeah, well, there are, lots, there are ways of doing that, and you can do it, you can audit it, and that's probably a, a, a question that would be beyond this meeting. But uh, yes, you would have to audit it. And that's why I'm also I'm saying that the, or, the architect here is very important because very often I think in this space it is the enthusiasts who are leading the charge, doing very good work. But for more enterprise level applications, I think it's going to be much more complicated than they think. Yes? I, I, which kind of leads on to one of my questions, which is, um, does, does IBM have an answer with GDPR and the privacy around right to forget? Yes. So is it a simple answer? Or? 
Well, the simple answer is that, you, uh, first of all, we, we, uh, we have GDP, support for GDPR. The yeah, simple answer is that you can put it on the, on the, not on the blockchain, but on the database that can be accessed by the blockchain. And then you do it that way. But it, it, I, but the blockchain cannot be changed, but the database can be changed. Right, okay. And, and is that the world state, the world state database. Yeah, okay. I was thinking of adding that to it here, but I thought that would be too, to take too long time. But the idea is that you write to the World State database. And now I say, I, I won't be forgiven, for, for, forgotten rather, I'm not forgiven as well, but forgotten at least, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and, and uh, you say, no, 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 I, I want to see you, you know, you, you, what, what you look like today. And then we simply change the World State database, my entry. Right. And the other, everything has to remain the same. Okay. That's the same in GDPR and the right to be forgotten. Yeah. And the reason this is an important point, because I've been asked this for a number of times before, how you do that. Mm -hmm. And I told them really, uh, I don't know. And they, they kind of they smiled smugly and you know. But I realized now that those, those questions are kind of tricky in a way because so much new is happening in blockchain. that even if you can do something today, you certainly will be able to do, do something in a few months. So there may not be an answer, but that doesn't mean that there will never be an answer. But GDPR is a good question. I was asking today here, by the way, if we can um, find out who came from what country. And we can't, because of GDPR. <laughs> but again, your questions are, are very good as well. I mean, this is not something where there is an a can't answer to exactly how to do it. But you have to, but you have to exist with, you have to know how to exist with external databases and use APIs to get the data you need. So I And I mean, it may be that for, the, for your use case, there is, no, there is no way of doing it except the way you are planning it and put it on the blockchain. That may very well be. It may very well be that, you, that your way of doing it is the only right way that everything has to go on the blockchain in this case. But there are other cases where it's, it's not possible, I think. So it's more, more a way of throwing up the discussion to show that everything is not limited to the blockchain, but there are other ways of doing it. I think you were say, saying something? Uh, yeah, so uh, more generally talking about these businesses on blockchain. So, uh, Clearly, I've been on a ton of work um, tooling for like the technical side of it. Is anyone working, to your knowledge, on sort of decision-making processes for business, like coming up with criteria that make it easy to evaluate whether something should be on blockchain? Or obviously, really big files. That's a good point she made a minute ago. And privacy, but more generally, like. I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen anything. I, I, I'm at the stage here, and I think the people I read are at the stage where they say that. You have to go beyond the blockchain paradigm. If you have to put, if there's data that is not available to you, you can maybe be able to use it off chain. And that realization maybe will probably lead to other ways. And you can use an API to get it. But that's where my understanding of what's going on is. But I think it's going to be more and more common. And the, uh, the, this GDPR is a very good example, or the right to be forgotten. Because I have been bombarded with questions about the right to be forgotten, as I said, for a long, long time. And they say, haha, now we got you because you say blockchain can never be changed, the data can never be changed, right? And I want to be forgotten. How can you forget me if you can't change the data? Ha ha. You know? And now we have the answer. You use the, the World State database and you change it with the World State database. And that's a, that's a perfectly good answer. And it, it, it keeps the, the blockchain paradigm intact. Right, 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 right. So I think there are many ways around it, but uh, again, I think the big picture, the way, the, the way I want to concentrate on myself, for myself, is the fact that once you begin to, to once you say, yes, we got funding, we got $500,000 to build an application in three months in the real estate business, you're going to say, oh, shoot. We didn't realize it was this complicated. 
because you cannot get, you, you don't have all the data you need, especially if it's real estate. You don't have it. So that's something, again, it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of saying, okay, okay, we want to blockchain. It's more a matter of saying, okay, we have to understand it more, which is what we need an architect. Yes? <coughs> what about posting encrypted data to the blockchain? Then you can control what can actually see the data. Yeah, that would be another way of moving, yes. So it, it's, it's more a matter of, so to speak, looking at the big picture, looking at what blockchain agrees with, what the blockchain paradigm allows and does not allow. And then see what you can what you can do to, to live under those constraints. Yes. When IBM uses the term blockchain, is it actually a chain of blocks as proposed in the Bitcoin white paper, where a block is a Merkel tree hash, and each block references the previous block? I wish you wouldn't have asked asked that question, but I will ask, I will answer that question because this this is yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can't get me that way. It's not a simple. <laughs> we have Hyperledger. We all know what Hyperledger fabric is. That is not IBM's. It's an open source. Linux Foundation owns it, and anybody can use it. To IBM, there's also IBM blockchain. What is IBM blockchain? That is the blockchain that you that is running in the cloud. So you now and you get together and you have this marvel and you of course you have this marvelous uh, application in Hyperledger. It works. You paid zero dollars and zero euros for building it. Because it's all free. It's all open source, it's all free. There's no hidden costs. You have it running on your laptops. You come to me and you say, look at what we have. And I say, I want to buy it. I want to pay a million dollars and a million euros. And you say, great, we, we've got money. And then I say, but of course you have to run it in the club. And you say, oh shoot. Because now it's going to cost you money. Where can you, which cloud can you run it in, by the way? If you have your fabric, which cloud can you run it in? You know, does anybody know? The oh, IBM cloud, yes, you've got first star, gold star, what other clouds? Well, the Oracle, that's the blockchain. Uh, yes. Oh. AWS. That's right. Yes, and uh, some Chinese clouds as well. Every cloud on, this, on the face of this world supports hyperledger fabric in its own cloud. It's pretty amazing. And when we do, when IBM does that in the IBM cloud, IBM cloud, IBM cloud, then it's called the IBM blockchain. So is it a chain of blocks? The way that the it's a chain of blocks, yes. Of blocks. Yes. But the IBM cloud, therefore, and the IBM, the IBM blockchain is what's running in the cloud. Is it still a, like, is there any, have you added any IP, like is there a lot of IP added to the IBM blockchain? Very, very good question. Here's the thing, everybody says, it's open source, it's free, everything, is, look at our code, everything is marvelous, everything is, doesn't cost a cent. In the same time, a number of entities, I'm not going to mention the names, are working overtime to get patents on things that they are creating. I was at the hackathon a few months ago, and this little old lady came up to me and said, what do you think of this? I'm going to file an IP for it. And she, I said, you shouldn't file IPs. Those are evil. You should just give it to the world. And she said, I don't agree with you. And she walked off, and she probably, and she said, I already have a number of IPs. And this is, this is something that you, is usually not talked very much about, but there are, there, the open source is real. People are for open source. But at the same time, there is a movement, a very strong movement for IP in the blockchain world. And exactly where those two intersect, I'm not smart enough to know, but, but it, it's, it's uh, so, uh, exactly. All right, here we have some code now. We have one gentleman who said he's gonna stay up to midnight to write the code. So we have, first of all, the prereqs, following the instructions in installing the prereqs, here we have Everything here is documented. The blue lines here are the pointers to the actual code. Install CLI tools. You see NPM uh, install dash key. You were warned in accepting this, uh, this uh, meetup that you would do all the code. But if you don't do it, I want to talk, I want to tell on you. NPM install global composer. 
And then you see a CLI 2020. 20. This was the latest version at the time of that I made this screenshot. And it made, it's growing very rapidly. Uh, Hypernetic Fabric comes out with a new version every quarter. Growing very, very rapidly. You mean Linux Foundation? Yes. So they, they are the best, the best thing that could happen to a hyperledger. I mean, they are, they are running this thing like it would, wherever I go to a big meetup, I'm running to somebody from the hyperledger, uh, the Linux Foundation, who, who give a talk. And they are running the meetup here, also the hyperledger fab fabric uh, meetup here in the city. Brian Billendorf, who is the head there, is usually giving, that, giving talks there. And you should go to those, because they, they're really, really good. REST server, generate hyperledger composer, and yoga. So these are very simple installs. And then we have here an alternative mass, mass install. You can do the same thing with just one line. We install the playground. We talked about the playground. We can set up our IDE, because we need an IDE as well. And we have all the information there. And then now we install Hyperledger Fabric. And you see, this is not very difficult. You get a tar.dc file that contains Fabric dev servers, you do a curl command, and within 40 minutes, you have downloaded everything and you have the, you have the runtime up and running. And this is a little bit old, it should be HLB 13 now, because we still really 13 without it. Start Fabric, create here at record. Start the web app playground. And this really is what it's all about. And then you have to, uh, how to dis de destroy your previous setup, which is important as well. So if you, uh, the gentleman in red here, if you want to do this later, and I'm not sorry for picking you, but if you want to do it, and the same for everybody here, use this thing, and this is how you do it. Hyperledger Fabric is the best documented project I have ever seen, and I've seen quite a few. It is amazingly well documented. There is nothing that, that is, you know, is, um, vague or, or uh, odd. It's written for people by, for programmers by, by programmers. So I can, really, you may not have, not have any experience at all except some in Node.js, and that's really enough. So then we go in here and we use Yeoman, and we select tutorial network for the network, Apache 2.0 as the license and select org example my network as the namespace. And we define the network, business network. And this is in the CTO model file. And we then, once it comes out empty, we then uh, fill in the information here. Like this. So it's a small trading application, very, very small. But at the end of this exercise, we have the, red, uh, the network running. We have the application running, and then we can go in and change and modify what we have already have running. It's much better to go this way than to start out and having to conceptualize everything. Let's start with the running application that we have created ourselves. And then we add the logic to it. I mentioned the JavaScript. Trade commodity owner, that asset registry, the await, et cetera, et cetera. Await asset registry and then adding access control. And this is all something that we can do in a matter of uh, 10 minutes, maybe. And here we have all the code. At the end of this exercise now, we have something running. On your laptop, ready to go. And then we have step three. Generate the business network archive. When we show, I showed you how to create the COBOL for, for uh, you know, blockchain language. It, gener it generates something called a business network archive. archive. And then we have to add that to the BNA file or banana file. We add that to our application. And that really is, we disp disp deploy, de deploy rather the business network. We generate the REST server, which we have to have. Generate the application. And here we are.
and again, if you if you are interested in learning how to program this thing, I urge you to go through this. If you have any problems, send me a, a question or post them online on the web. But this really is no harder than it, it looks like here. Now we view what you can do is write an, you can write an application. Now we come to the questions you have brought out and other people have brought out. How, how, do, how do we actually write a real application that is more than just displaying some information? And that's where uh, our domain knowledge is going to be the first st guiding factor. Do we know our space? If we know our space and you know, you know, you know your space, then no problem. You, uh, you know what you want to do and you know if you can quickly see if you can do it. If we are simply Bitcoin or blockchain or something, fanatics or, or enthusiasts who want to build something cool, then maybe they should take some chance to, to, to come to this really good user group, user group and learn more or just read up on what they want to do. If, uh, yes. If people wanted to say someone started an application and started using it with people and yes. they wanted to exchange money, mm -hmm. uh, is that something outside of Hyperledger? They would like go to PayPal or something else? Or do they exchange money within? No, you don't exchange money within. No, money. No, no, no money. Unfortunately, not. Sorry. <laughs> but Bitcoin, I understand. You can do that. Or Hyperia. No, and it's a good question because this comes up, it comes up again with the question of, well, why not? I said this was a business application, so if you and I trade in, in uh, something, wherever, why shouldn't I be able to pay for you? But that's also why we have gotten this thing, two things. There is talk now about uh, the, the question that, that tokens would not be a good thing to have. Tokens can be any, mean anything we want it to mean. So if you and I create a, a token, and you get a token, if you sell me things and vice versa, what harm has been done with that? But also keep in mind that Ethereum and, and Hyperledger are be, being more intertwined. And I happen to know that things are coming down the pike. And if you say, can you tell that to us? I can say, yes, I can, but you can look at the, look at the code because it's all open source. I was slapped on the wrist one day, uh, three months ago, when I, when I said, can I share this with, the, with, with the, my you know, audiences? And he said, did you know we are doing open source here? Or where, which world do you think you are in? Look at the code for heaven's sake, he said, and that's the point. Everything really is in the code, even upcoming functionality. So, but, but again, it's a matter of coming up with a very good business idea and then see what you can do in, in, in Hyperledger Fabric, or maybe you can use it in another Hyperledger variation. And uh, then see what is missing and then put some, co uh, some code out or put some notes out on the forums and say, well, is somebody else doing the same thing? And uh, what can we do here? So it's a very, this is social. People, it used to be that the programmers were nerds who sat in the, 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 the you know, little rooms when everybody else was not having fun. Now everything is social. We come to meetings like this and we make friends and we, we, and we go to hackathons all weekends and we make friends. And, and we learn things from other people who we didn't know even half an hour ago. So that is really the, the, the brand new thing here. Okay, now deploying it, this is the end, I promise. Deploying the, to the IBM Cloud. So now then we have an application, it runs, it works, and it wasn't harder than I intimated it was. Now we have to run it in the cloud. Which cloud you run it is, is up to you and your conscience, but you know since you've gone to come to this meetup, 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 you will have go with the IBM Cloud. And I will tell people you told me so. We have a starter membership plan here, 250 uh, US dollars membership fee per month. And this is because this is, again, you wouldn't be here unless you really wanted to run it in, 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 in industrial strength. Otherwise, you can run it on your laptop and nobody cares. But this is not you running a real application. We have all the, it's very easy to get started here. And you even have a membership, an enterprise membership uh, plan that is for really big applications. And here you can see what you can do very easily. You can spin up, for instance, here, a new network, have an order, a CA, <coughs> peer. You can have, you define members, channels, notifications, APIs, develop code, install code, try samples, doing everything through the console here in the cloud. And then what, what you're running, you can run in China, you can run in France, you can run here, you can run anywhere you want to. And this, therefore, is the way most people who are, have enterprise application in mind would end up. But the good news is that when you're at this stage, you have a, you have a proposed customer. Otherwise, there would be no need really to do this thing. So how does it 
you ask me that for a second. So, so let's say that we build an app and right. we, we run the blockchain on your server um, and how, how does it scale in terms of the nodes? You know, how does it get past the 51% rule? And to, because one of the things that I'm, I'm questioning in my mind where okay. the gentleman was talking earlier about gas, yes. and, you know, and, and the incentives of you know, creating yourself as a node on the Ethereum network right. is for to, to mine and, and mm, yeah, very much so, monetize yeah. it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously not that incentive for somebody to become a node on Hyperledger. Well, it is if they're part of your network or the network that you want to help out with this. Right, but it's, but it's purely sort of voluntary in terms of offering yourself up there, right? It is voluntary, but on the other hand, without there being some nodes, there would not be a network. Right. So if you approach me and I have a company and I say, that's great, I want to be on your network, you tell me, okay, here's how you create your node. So, so how does the contract work with, you know, where you had sort of, you know, $1,000 for an enterprise? Right. How many nodes does that provide you? And, and so if we, you know, we're building ourselves our own private network. Right. I'm trying to understand that as to say, do, do, do I then say, well, I can run that globally and the, that X amount I'm paying a month provides me with 12 capacity nodes that I can run anywhere. You can make those calculations and you probably would have come to us to make them because I haven't seen anything. I know that you not, don't need too many, too many nodes. Once I was approached with the question, it's a thousand nodes, all right, and, and you right. know, no, you don't need to go that high. It's a, it's a handful of nodes. Right. Even if you have a sizable uh, net business network, it's going to be a, a handful of nodes. It's not, it's not a big number. And but on the, other, scale? on the other hand, the question is about scalability and so forth is, is, is very important. And therefore, you would probably come to us to ask those questions because I haven't seen anything documented. Right. But it would not be something we would charge money for. It would be simply saying that I'm at this stage now. Can you tell me, uh, you know, how I go? And you can probably do that also on the open internet to ask those questions. Yeah, right. Yeah, because I'm just sort of thinking, you know, for example, if you're getting to month end, and then all of a sudden, no right, prices kick in, then you know, all of a sudden you could find that, and, and you know, and that's that's where Ethereum does a good job around the gas prices go up, right? So they compensate for the network capabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and prices increase to cope with that, right? And then the prioritization happens where with Hyperledger you can create your own um, throttling. Yep, yes. But it gets complicated as to understand it. Right. right. Okay, I'll be some Also, I think, keep in mind that we had the number of um, sample applications here. Mm. You can take a look at those as well. They yeah, may be right. there. And also, if you want to send me this question, I can return it. Because I think it's a really good question. I haven't seen it phrased the, you, the way you phrased it. Right. And I think it's a very good way to phrase it because I mean, you, this is the information you need. You, you want to do what we ask you to do, namely host on our cloud. Right. So you need this information to, before you can do so. And that usually gets answers very quickly. Right. Because there's real money involved. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, here, and you can see here, a race to the middle or a race to the, the floor. All the clouds here are fighting for these customers. As we mentioned, every single cloud has <laughs> support for hyperledger fabric. To my amazement, when I saw that, every single cloud, including uh, including Alibaba and other clouds, and everybody's trying to woo customers by making them as cheap as possible. So for a developer, this is very good news. You can, in other words, write, run something in the cloud uh, and demo it in the cloud to your customers without spending enormous amounts of money. And that's the end of the story, so to speak, because now you're in the cloud, you have learned how to create hyperledger applications, and you're going to be a success, and you're going to say that it's because I came to this meetup that it all happened. That's pretty much what I had, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll answer your question, but it's just so I remember what I was going to say. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to friend me on LinkedIn, and I will answer your questions. Yes? I, I, I'm still getting to know, expecting you to answer yeah, yeah, your yeah. question. Uh, what kind of consensus server people who created black in uh, hyperledger fabric? Well, typically it's a PBFT, practical it? Byzantine fault tolerance. Practical? Practical Byzantine ah. fault tolerance, if you are. 
Right. So of, of this type, so you, you just restrict it to this type, and any consensus uh, server based on this type of security right. is blocked. That's yes, security. that's right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on. It's a really good thing to, to a lot of work going on uh, on the consensus algorithms as well. New things are coming on the horizon. So knowing that is a very good skill to have, so to speak. No, 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 no. But uh, and also not everyone. There is no no such thing as a one perfect uh, plug, uh, you know algorithm. Everyone has the faults, the strengths and, and the weaknesses. So finding the right one is the consensus algorithm. It's, it's not as simple as one would think. One would think that you know, this is, is the one that has the gold medal and everybody else is kind of, no. It is um, as much with the blockchain when you get into it, the you fabric, when you get into the, 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 the basement of it, so to speak, things, are, things get kind of complicated. It's easy to, you know, we like to say that, as, as I said here, that you can write, get something up and write, writing very quickly, as our friend here will do in the next, couple of hours, he will have something up and running. But then he, what he will find, which we will not find as quickly, is that once you have that, you get all these questions. Which, you know, which PBFT algorithm is better, you know, what, what, uh, how do, can I run in the cloud? And this is not, this is really great fun. I wouldn't have changed this for any other job in the world. But don't think it is very simple. Because once you get to write enterprise applications, enterprise applications are never simple. Never. It's fun to learn these new things, but don't think that yeah, I can knock that off you know, in, in, in you know, a few, few hours. You may not be able to, unless you've done this before. Sorry, you, you were? Yeah, so you, I mean, you got that out here, but it looks like, you know, uh, at AWS, like EC2, like add more application was kind of, kind of button, but right. what you're doing, you're doing, uh, as you said, you're doing this deep fault tolerant consensus, so I mean, adding more peers isn't going to get you more throughput, right? They all have to process the transactions. Right. So how do you, what's the benefit, like especially on a private network, like once you have enough peers who feel like you have um, some redundancy in case you lose one, or there's an outage, like why have more? No, no, you, you, you don't. And there was, there was a very good IBM architect who has written, and I can, if you, if you ping me later, I can, I can give you his um, uh, articles, very, very smart articles. And he said it's very the same thing. I mean, why do you want to add? You know, notes, uh, tell me why you want to add the notes and people say, well, I don't know. I mean, it sounded good to me, right? Yeah. But it's not good to anybody. And that's why, again, speaking to myself rather than to you, is that I'm finding that what I thought was simple three months ago turns out to be there's always a basement under the basement. Once you get down there, there's also always things you have to learn. So to become really good, really good, to become a good architect in this space, you need to spend some time building applications, really, which is the good news, right? And then for each one, you will find things that you never thought you had to learn. And then you become even more attractive on the, on the job market. And make even more money when you find the server application on the IBM cloud. But to answer that question as well, so one thing that we're looking to desire is we're, we're going to have um, dynamic consensus. So we, we will get to the point where for lower priority items where we don't need right. um, you know, everybody to, you know, if it's a low risk item, right. then we will just get to the point where we'll just take a certain amount of nodes to That's do the consensus and then go from there. Uh -huh. So then we can scale faster by the fact that, you know, we'll get to the point where we'll say, well, once we get three nodes, then we're, we're good to go right. and off it goes. Where if it's something that's maybe a payment or something, a peer to peer oh, transaction, yeah, yeah. then it's a case of no, we want the whole consensus to ensure. Are you going to document it? I, I will do once I get the time, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so, so then it gets to the point where having more nodes does provide us that throughput because we can scale on the fact that we can set um, and, and we can, we're even looking at um, dynamically doing the consensus based upon um, time zone geography as to who's using the network and who's not. Which is perfect for the cloud, is perfect for that, of course. Right. Yeah. So that's a very good use case for the cloud as well. And keep in mind, the cloud was quite new in the space. So we, I'm certain we're going to get lots of more writings, articles about what you can do in the cloud that we haven't got yet because it's new. Because it was just a few months ago when, it, when the cloud was opened up for blockchain. So I kind of, you know, the only scenario I can imagine right now is a, a, a kind of a consortium of a kind of enterprise bodies who get together and just, you know, do this, uh, you know, kind of nature, kind of, you know, application just amongst themselves. 
it could be a bunch of pens or a bunch of mm -hmm. scribes. Uh, yeah. Um, can you tell me, you know, what else can be done beyond that? I, my opinion is that it might be the three of you here, or four of you, who have created an application and who have a prospective buyer who has requirements. It has to run this fast, it has to run in, in, in the US, in Japan, and in France. And they're willing to pay, well, ten, to say, $100 million. I mean, it's big money to your small company. And they have, the, they have those requirements. If you, if you do this, if you make your application run like this, we'll, we'll, we'll get pay for the, your application. And you say, the only way we can do, we have the money now on the table. The only way we can get this running in the, in the time zones is through a cloud. So let's use the cloud. And the, 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 the people who bought your application never mentioned the cloud. They don't even know that their application is running in the cloud. They just have, the, you have, they have a URL to it. You're, run, you're managing the cloud for them and you get charging money for it. So I don't think that it's anything to do with people who are saying necessarily, I want to, it to be in the cloud. You will make that decision. Maybe I come to you and say, I want it to run in the cloud. And you say, no, no, you don't need that. Yes. Entities that Absolutely, yes. And, and, and so, so, so for security reasons, right? Yes, right. I agree. So, so if, if, if I'm an e-commerce and I have millions of users, I would not do that with my users because I'm not going to maintain millions. <laughs> right. 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 right, So that's, that's kind of type of limitations that I have in mind. Like, so that kind of limits of, uh, you know, how many body scanners are so what kind of you know, interesting scenarios you tell us about? It's not just, I don't know, maybe a thousand you know, banks got to guess or something like that. What the banking scene I'm not into, but the hospital, uh, healthcare I'm very interested in. And the healthcare is, is going to happen. It, it, it fits quite nicely with patient records and other things. It's going to take time because it's heavily regulated. But that is something that I like. Food safety is another one that is actually IBM is building a number of applications. I'm sorry? <laughs> no, what, sorry, I didn't hear you. It's the Walmart in space. Oh, yeah, you're right. 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 Yeah. It's very big. It's very big. I'm not that excited about that, but just because I'm, I'm, I'm not that excited about food, but I mean, it's, it's very interesting, though. don't get me wrong. And the point is, there's one good point about high, the food safety as well, is that those are the use cases we have to go through before we begin to write our own application. If we see that there are 20 or 30 um, applications for food safety, we know that blockchain can be used for food safety. And that's good. If there are no applications out in, in, in but, the air. Right, but, but again, that's, that's, that's what I was wondering. It can be used for food safety. You seriously, if I would Right. It can be classified if you use an API to pull in crucial information to the blockchain, to put pointers in the blockchain. You can never, for instance, put X-rays in the blockchain because X-rays are made of digital material, so to speak. But you can have pointers to it. I see. And that's enough. That's enough to, to satisfy the, the, the requirements for the so application. So mathematically, it would be then verified. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. And the, the, there's a diamond uh, verification application that is very interesting. Uh, so in South Africa, they didn't mine diamonds. And they have now a diamond application that IBM has highlighted where they can see if the diamond that you buy for $10 million, uh, be just because you like, happen to like it, is fake or, or real. And of course, there's no way to put the diamond on the blockchain, but you can put pointers. So it, it does work to get to use, to use pointers, and, and that is a way around some of these real, real problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And with that, I think we are pretty much uh, at the One end. Last question, if you guys have any. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nine after me. That's been great, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.